income tax 2023-2024 tax types or categories get ready and some coffee so you can recognize the quacks while doing income tax preparation 2023-2024 first a word from our sponsor yeah actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us but but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff anyways like our accounting rocks product line if you're not crunching cords using excel you're doing it wrong a must-have product because the fact as everyone knows of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement the obligation a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse and the muse she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets so get the shirt because the creative muse she could use a new pair of shoes if you would like a commercial free experience consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com we now want to take a look at some categories of taxes some types of taxes these types and categories of taxes often coming up when we're listening to discussions about tax law these types and categories of taxes could be useful from a practical data input tax preparation standpoint as well in that they might give us a better understanding of the type of tax we are working on helping us to better understand the data input process and planning process for tax preparation and planning however these are often going to be terms that are useful when discussing different types of taxes in the format of what changes should we make to the tax law what type of tax would be the best for a particular type of uh, situation also note that when we're talking about taxes there's not really anything new under the sun in other words governments have been taxing people for a long time they've gotten quite creative with taxes for a long time the question these days is what kind of tax is being applied in the particular situation and then what kind of little tweak might they be putting on it given the circumstance the particular circumstance that that tax is being applied to also note that when we talk about these blanket terms they are often used in political discussions in a similar way as the terms fair to have a fair tax or a just tax are used as basically very broad statements that don't really say anything that that has enough uh, definition to be meaningful because they're basically just going to stick a label on something with these types of terms and label it as good or bad and then try to leave the discussion from there whereas usually things are much more nuanced than that there's much more complex than that and you have to kind of get into the weeds a little bit to see how the taxes are actually playing out in practice first category we have the flat tax or proportional tax we'll get into more detail about the definitions and how these work shortly let's first just lay them out and list them next we have the progressive tax and then we have the regressive tax now you can imagine just by the names presented here that if you have a political discussion that's happening about the tax code what kind of tax should be be in place what kind of changes should be made to the tax code the terminology of a progressive tax sounds kind of nice so even if you don't know anything about taxes you're probably like yeah progressive I kind of like the ring of that it sounds positive <laughs> and then a regressive tax sounds kind of negative and then the flat tax sounds somewhat neutral but normally what will happen is they're going to say that the flat tax is a regressive tax so that's probably the argument that you're going to hear oftentimes when you hear these type of terms in political discussions they're going to be used as labels to just negatively or positively tag a particular tax in a similar way as saying I want a fair tax system or an unfair tax system if you just label something as unfair that's you know that's it well it's, I want the fair one not the unfair one but really you have to you have to kind of dig down a little bit deeper to understand what's actually happening uh, to make a fair choice uh, rather than just try to label the things because these are very broad labels so let's go into the first one in more detail a flat or proportional tax 
Now, this is the, the first kind of thing that you would probably think of when you, if you were to try to implement a tax in and of yourself, right? So if you had a community, for example, and you're saying we need to have defense in this community, which is basically what the federal government was originally designed for. We need to have a standing army. We, just, we can't just have a ragtag grump, bunch of people that are going to somehow piece them together once we've been attacked, right? It's too slow. So we need to have like an army. We need to set something up so that we can have a fire brigade that's going to be set up quickly and so on uh, and so forth. Well, how would you do that? Well, traditionally, you would say, well, I'm going to I'm going to tax people based on uh, their earnings. And so you might say 10 percent, for example, which is you might recognize as like a charitable contribution in some you know, religious areas. 10 percent would be like a flat type of tax. And that means that if you make more money, then you will be taxed more because 10 percent of one thousand dollars is going to be less than 10 percent of one hundred thousand dollars. So you can see that it's still a tax that's going to tax more as your as people's income levels rise is the general is the general idea. So that's kind of like the baseline tax that you, you would first have in mind. It's probably the first thing that would come to mind if you were trying to think of a tax system so that you can put together community resources for the greater good, which would usually be. Uh, the, for defense, right? For defense or for like a fire department or police or something like that. So then you, the, one example of that is Social Security. Now, Social Security, this is not a perfect example. And like I say, in practice, there aren't exactly perfect examples of like flat taxes usually or progressive taxes, right? They're not, the, it, the, it's really more of like, is this a more progressive tax or a flatter tax? We can talk in terms of how progressive it is and how flat it is. So, for example, with Social Security, uh, we have kind of a flat tax up until a point. So, for example, if you make $40,000, the Social Security rate, we're just lock, looking at the employee side and not the employer side, is 6.2%. And that means that the tax would be uh, 2480 for $40,000. If you made $100,000, the tax rate is the same. That's what we mean by it's flat. The rate doesn't change. The income level did change. And therefore, the person that makes more money also pays more taxes. So that's the general idea. Now, note that we could argue that the Social Security system isn't exactly flat because it has a cap on it. So I'll talk about that shortly. But Let's just look at what we have here and think about what are the pros and cons of a flat tax system. Well, one of the benefits of a flat tax system is it's easy. It's easy to calculate because I, all I need to know is how much someone earned and then I multiply the same rate by the amount that they earned. If they earned 100,000, I still just multiply by the same rate. It's easily made projections too. I can, I can project how much the tax will be by projecting how much income I'm going to make. And I don't have to do some complex calculation uh, in order to get the number. When we do payroll taxes, that's when we typically have the social security tax calculation. And we can typically calculate how much the tax will be as we pay people on a paycheck by paycheck basis. And then when we do the informational form, the 941 on a quarterly basis, as opposed to a yearly basis, the form similar to the form 1040 for federal income taxes. For payroll taxes, we don't have to deal with this, oh, we had to overpay so that we don't have a penalty or something like that. Why? Because we already knew exactly how much to, to withhold and pay because it was an easy thing to calculate. Whereas obviously the income tax system, we don't. That's why we shoot for basically a refund. So the ease is one of the benefits. Another benefit, of course, is that as income levels go up, then the people with higher income pay more into the system, which is what we would kind of accept, expect is kind of fair because the higher earners can afford to pay more into the system, number one. And number two, the higher earners are probably the ones that have more to lose uh, in the event, if you're talking about the military, if a foreign person or foreign country came in and took all the land over here, the, the person that has higher income might own more of it, right? So they have more investment in things like military protection or something uh, like that as well. And we can see that as the income, as people's income goes up, 
They don't like lose incentive to make more money because the next dollar that they make will still be taxed at 6.2%. So it's not like they're going to make, if they make $101, the next dollar they're going to make is going to be taxed at a much higher rate, which you would think would disincentivize people to keep on generating revenue, which we really want people to do. You might say, well, why do I want people to keep earning money after 100000 They have what they need past that point. But the, the, when, when we're thinking about the economy, we're thinking about a pie that's growing. So if, if they're actually getting paid for things that they are producing, then they're actually increasing the GDP. They're increasing the value of the stuff. So we want to incentivize people to work because that increases the, the pie. It's not just about resources that are being redistributed because that would be like we're just redistributing the oil in the ground without making it into gas or something. It's useless to people unless someone refines it into the gas. And, you know, you have to have you have to have incentives for people to basically do that. So the pie, the pie, the GDP pie is actually made up of production. It's not just natural resources that are making up the pie that we can just div divvy up. So it's not a fixed pie. The pie needs to grow uh, if you want to maximize the amount that individuals will, will get. Now, I want to touch that the Social Security can be thought of as not a flat tax in the sense that it has a cap on it. So if you get if you earn over a certain amount of money, you actually stop paying money into the Social Security system. And obviously you might look at that and say, well, that's crazy because now you're as someone earns more money, they, they should be paying more into the system. They shouldn't stop paying into the system if they have over like if they have two hundred thousand dollars, they stopped paying into the system. They should be they should have an increased tax rate. Why would that be the case? And one of the rationales for this is that we we as a country seem to be like confused about our our social benefit programs. The question is, is Social Security a federally funded like retirement program, which is more and more what it looks like, or is it a safety net? When Social Security was put in place in the 30s, it was it seemed like it was thought more as a safety net program. In other words, people that were not able to save for retirement, possibly because they're living longer than expected or had some kind of crisis, we want to care for and make sure that we have uh, a net, a safety net for them. But the Social Security isn't necessarily designed as everyone's retirement plan, right? But later and later, it seems like that, that it is like the Social Security program, the tax rate has gotten pretty high. And this is the employee portion, the employer portion is matching that. So 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 that's, you know, 12.4 uh, percent. And so it seems like the Social Security is now acting as a federal funded retirement program that everybody should get. You're going to pay into it. And they structured it like that as well, because it looks like a 401k plan where you put money in and the employer matches it. So now there's this expectation that that everybody should get money out of it. If I paid money into it, I should get money out of it. Now, when the money comes out of the Social Security, it's 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 somewhat tapered in terms of of, of the benefit of the money that went into it. So the later dollars that go into Social Security, you get less of a benefit of the money that comes out of Social Security. So in other words, if you thought it was a 401k plan, the more money you put into the 401k plan, the more you should get out in retirement. But with the Social Security, the higher income that you put into the to the to the Social Security system, you're getting less of a benefit with the higher with the more money that you're putting into the system. And at some point you don't get any further benefit. So and so that's the rationale that that that. We, we should have a cap on it because if you go over a certain threshold on the income, you're not getting any benefit for what's supposed to come back to you when we're thinking about Social Security as basically a retirement program. So the bottom line is this is one of the areas that we as Americans really need to basically look at. Do we want to have a, a system that's like a federal retirement program? We can't just yank the carpet out of the people that have already paid into it and have promises to it, but it's somewhat bankrupt at this point in time. The money that's going into it is being taken right out at this point in time to pay the retirements of the current people. It's not being put into a savings account or anything like that. So that's one of the, one of the huge, huge debates uh, because it's a huge part of our, our spending. But let's continue on with our discussion. Then we have a progressive tax. 
Now, the, obviously, the big example of a progressive tax is the, the federal income tax system. Now, with a flat tax, we saw that as you earn more money, you still pay more into the system because you would be paying, you know, whatever percent, 6.2% in our case of higher income. So if you make $1,000 times 6.2, you're gonna pay less than $10,000 times the 6.2%. But we could get more progressive on the taxes and we can say that as your income goes up, we're actually going to increase the rate. So it's not just that you're gonna pay 10% on the higher income, you're gonna pay 12% once you go over a certain threshold. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail in a second, but first let's just think about the pros and cons of that. Uh, one of the pros is that, that now we can say, well, the people that are getting more of a benefit are paying more into the system. Now, again, it used to be the argument was if, if you're paying for the military, rich people should be paying more into the system because they own the property that the military is going to basically be defending, right? They're using the infrastructure that, that's being put in place more than uh, normal people. Uh, th but this, this argument is a little bit more difficult to make when the major, when as the spending shifts from military spending to like social welfare programs and stuff like that, then then it's, it might not be the, the wealthy people that are getting the most benefit out of it. But still, the argument would be that, you know, obviously, as income uh, goes up, they have more capacity to pay into, uh, you know, the system. So that's going to be, you know, one of the benefits of it. What are the cons of the system? Well, clearly, it's a whole lot more complex uh, to do. So it's a lot harder for us. This is one of the major reasons that we can't predict how much we should withhold out of our wages uh, because the tax rates will change dramatically if there's a, a change or a difference in how much earnings uh, that we had. Some people argue, well, this isn't a problem because you have computers to figure that out. It's a simple problem for a computer. And that's true when you're a tax preparer because we will rely on the computer to basically do the progressive tax calculation. However, business people that are trying to invest and look into the future have to make projections like 10 years into the future and the projections get a whole lot more complex when you're when your income levels change and then you have to deal with the, the different changes in the tax brackets and whatnot and then if you get into flow through entities and, and so on being taxed on the individual level versus the corporate level and then you have different taxes for capital gains tax versus ordinary income it really gets quite complex when you're trying to again make projections uh, into the future. Also, you have the system or the problem of the tax rates drastically possibly changing uh, from period to period as uh, administrations change. So that's some of the difficulty uh, with the taxes. It could also be somewhat uh, disincentivizing when you earn more money. So in other words, if, if, I'm, if, if I had a flat tax, and I, and I earn a lot of money, I'm still incentivized to increase my production and make more stuff, which would be good for GDP, because the next dollar I make will still be taxed at the same rate. But here, then, like if I'm, if I'm moving from this bracket to this bracket, I'm going from 35% to 37%. So, so there could be a, a disincentive as you make more money to, to basically uh, make more money because more of that money is gonna to go to taxes and the taxes are a disincentive to make money. In other words, if you imagine that you were in a communist system where they just take all of your money and then they give it to the people that need it the most or they evenly distribute it, what would be the incentive uh, in that system for the people that are, are making the stuff? Well, the incentive would be to be a deadbeat, right? You'd wanna make as little things as possible and then the, the, that's the, that would be the incentive, right? You do, you do as little as possible and then get paid as much as you can, which will be the same as your neighbor while doing less work, right? That's kind of the incentive. That's why, that's why really high you know, socialistic or communist plans typically, one reason they do not work, right? Because if you take all the money, no one's going to do any work, right? The, the, the incentive will actually be to not work. If you work, you're a sucker, right? Because you're going to get paid the same amount. 
So the so the incentive structure. So we want to keep an incentive structure that still tr doesn't decrease the 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 desire to work, because again, the 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 people that are working are making the actual stuff. We don't have we have nothing to divvy up between between the people if people aren't making things. There's there's no point in divvying up oil that's not refined into gas. <laughs> there's a it doesn't you know, someone's got to do the work before you have something that can actually be distributed. Okay, so let's get it a little, now it's not as bad as it might look at, at first when you're saying, well, if I, make more, if I make more money, I'm gonna get taxed at 24% as opposed to 10%. It's not exactly like that, because what happens is uh, you're, gonna get, you're gonna get taxed. Let's look at the single bracket. These are gonna be the, the uh, filing types. So single, head of household, married filing joint, married filing separate. That also, of course, adds a huge level of complexity because now we have a whole different set of tax brackets depending on our filing status, which, as you can imagine, will have an impact on people, for example, deciding if they want to be single head of household, which means they have a child, a dependent, or married filing joint, right? And so there's just serious questions could come up. Is the tax code incentivizing marriage? Is it incentivizing children? Is it incentivizing single family households versus uh, uh, two parent households uh, in terms of how it's set up? And we'll talk more about that later. But right now, let's just look at the progressiveness. So let's just look at the single area. So when it says 10%, we're talking about 10% of zero to 11,000. And it's also a little bit confusing because we're talking about taxable income, which is basically the bottom line of like the income statement part of the tax return, meaning you have the, the gross income minus the deduction, which are the above the line deductions, and then the standard or itemized deductions. And then you have the taxable income, which will then be applied the tax rate to. So, so then if you go over the 11,000, then, then it's not like you're gonna apply the 12%. If you made 44,000, you're not gonna be taxed entirely at 12%, you will be taxed up to the 11,000, basically at the 10%. And then the difference between the 11,000 and the upper threshold that you got to like 40,000, for example, would be taxed at the 12%. If you make over 44, 725, let's say you make 80,000, then the first 11,000 in theory will be taxed at 10%. From 11,000 to 44,725 at 12%, from 44,725 up to the threshold in the bracket that you are in, the marginal tax rate, highest tax rate, 22% in this case, up from 44,726 up to whatever 80,000 we said was the cap. So that's the idea of it. So it's not, so, so if someone says they're in the 22nd tax bracket or something like that, doesn't mean that they're paying 22% on all of their taxes if that's their marginal tax rate, right? That means that's the highest taxes, which means the next dollar that they earn, they are less incentivized to earn it because it'll be taxed at 22% than the first dollar they earn because the first dollar was only taxed at, you know, 10%. That's gonna be, you know, the general idea. So you can see the rationale of this kind of, you know, it has some sense to it that we're gonna try to increase the rates as we go up, but, you can see it's also quite complex like, like to try to, to try to say it's not only that the rates going up but i also have to look at these brackets in terms of single versus head of household and married and if i'm doing planning that becomes that becomes fairly cumbersome uh to do and to uh project out in other words as a tax preparer it's not going to be so bad because the tax software will do that for us but if you were to ask an average tax preparer, how in the world did you get from an income of $80,000 to the tax that is owed? They, they probably wouldn't be able to say, well, this, the software calculated that, right? <laughs> because, because it's so, and then, if, and if that's the case, then the question is, well, and you have to have some idea, we'll talk about this later, because if you get into more complex taxes and planning, then it becomes, it becomes an issue because if they're like, well, what if I make, what if I go from making 80,000 to 110,000 or something like that? Then what's gonna be the difference? How much more should I be withholding? How much more money am I going to owe? 
Well, that becomes kind of difficult to calculate if you don't really understand how these brackets work because because you're not because you would have an average tax, meaning the average tax that you made versus your top tax bracket. So if you made more money, you're going to be you're going to be paying at the top tax bracket. So that's your marginal tax rate in economic terms. The next dollar that you make, that's going to be the impact of the tax on it. And then, if, of course, if you go up to the next tax bracket, then the dollars that go up above that bracket will be taxed at another at the next rate up. So when you look at tax software, you'll typically see two rates, an average rate, which will be lower than the marginal rate, which will be the top rate. And if someone earns more money or uh, is going to earn less money in the future, then you kind of have to use the marginal tax rate usually <laughs> rather than the average. All right. So we'll get into that later. But, uh, next, uh, taxes are calculated using multiple tax rate uh, rates that increase with tax base. Next, we have the regressive tax. Now, a regressive tax is a tax rate decreases as wage base increases. And the, the sales tax is sometimes used as an example of, of basically a regressive type tax. Now, regressive, as you can hear from the tone of it, you probably hear, well, that sounds kind of negative on uh, the regressive tax. And usually that's how it will be labeled. This is the label that people will put on from a political standpoint to try to just trounce a tax policy before it gets it gets off the ground, right? They'll say, ah, that's regressive, done, it's all, it's over, right? But But again, a lot of times it becomes a little bit more complex than just simply labeling something. So for example, they'll try to label something like the flat tax as a regressive tax, but it's not really a regressive tax because we saw that the flat tax does pay more money as you gener generate more revenue. It's just that it doesn't increase as much as the progressive tax, which means that you can now start talking about whether a tax is more or less progressive uh, or more or less flat. In other words, you can see this, this thing has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven brackets. Well, what if you added, what if you made it have like nine brackets? Well, then you have made it kind of more complex, which is kind of like more progressive generally. Although you can also change the, the intervals in all kinds of crazy ways. It's infinite how complex it can get if you start tweaking this table all over the place. Now, oftentimes, so the questions will often be, well, we're in a progressive tax system. If you wanted to simplify the tax code, which was kind of the trend a few years ago, then the idea would be, I want to move from all these tax brackets to at least go into fewer tax brackets, because that'll make it at least a little bit easier. And that you can say that you would be flattening the tax system in that case, which would be a form of simplification or making it a less progressive tax. And again, you can see the terminology on that would be used depending on which side of the debate you would be on. So if you, if you were lowering the number of brackets and you were in favor of increasing the number of brackets, you would argue that it was a less progressive. You're making the tax less progressive. You might even go and say that you're making the flat regressive, which would be a lie really, but, but you know, that doesn't stop these debates, right? And then, it, or if, you, if you're in favor of it, you might say that you're trying to flatten the tax or possibly you would start out by saying, I'm trying to simplify the tax code by flattening it. Obviously the news generally tries to say that flat tax is equivalent with a regressive tax, right? Because most people in like the media, for example, are probably going to try to argue for a more complex tax uh, system, more progressive, right? Always more progressive. So, so regressive, as we saw, would typically be, that would be the, the claim that you're making. You're just trying to help the rich people, right? You're making a tax that is falling more heavily on poor people than the rich people. You're like the sheriff of Nottingham. And, uh, and, uh, and so you're horrible, right? That's basically what the label of the regressive tax kind of means uh, in practice. What are some examples of where that could happen in practice? possibly like a sales tax is the classic example. In Europe, they have a lot of sales, a sales or usage tax uh, is something often applied. In the United States, some states apply uh, a usage tax instead of an income tax. But for the federal government, we have an income tax system. And anybody that brings up 
a sales tax system is going to be usually shut down with or they will attempt to shut it down with this kind of regressive tax argument. Now, I'm not arguing for one or the other. I'm not sure we could actually politically make the move to a sales tax from a from a federal income tax. And I would hate to add a new tax on top of the federal income tax because that would that would just mean it would just grow from there. That's all taxes ever do. They just the law the law when the tax law first went into place was only supposed to be on very wealthy people because they're the people that could afford it, number one. And again, those are the people that needed to pay for the military because the military was protecting their land, right, was the general idea. So they should be paying for it. But now, of course, the tax is applied to everyone uh, uh, at this point, and the income tax is, is, is reaching down to more people. The sales tax, would the same thing would happen. They would put a, a modest sales tax in, and then it would grow, right? <laughs> so that's how, that's how it works. So I'm not, but from a, from a theoretical standpoint, uh, is a sales tax regressive? Why would it be regressive? Well, the argument is that if you're, if you're taxing people when they buy stuff, then, then that's going to benefit wealthy people because if wealthy people didn't want to pay taxes, all they have to do is buy less stuff because they have a lot more disposable income. Whereas if you're not wealthy, you're paying all your money on the necessities, which is like food, water, transportation, gas, the things that you need, the essentials. And therefore, they, have, they don't have the capacity to not be spending money on, on these things. And therefore, they're going to pay a higher percentage of their income to taxes than rich people who would be able to, if they wanted to, not spend money on things and therefore avoid the tax. Now, that makes sense to some degree. However, you can kind of tweak that f f pretty easily because like, like a lot of states, for example, some things will not be taxed. So if you just didn't tax the staple things, then you can kind of, you can kind of adjust that pretty quickly. Meaning if you say, okay, well, I, well, what if I do this? I do not tax the, the food. I do not tax the gas. And and um, and so we don't tax the necessities, right? And then everything else is going to be taxed. Well, then the argument doesn't. Then all the people that are paying all of their money for the necessities and don't have the capacity to buy things other than the, the necessities wouldn't be subject to any tax because they'd be paying all their money for food and food and gas in theory. And the rich people who are, let's face it, they're more likely to be out there buying stuff. It's not like they're, they're going to be buying the yachts. They're going to be shopping at the fancy restaurants and whatnot. And they're going to be the ones that will be subject to uh, the tax in those cases when they buy the more, uh, the more fancy kind of things. So by doing that, I think you can pretty easily tweak a sales tax system so that it's not, you know, regressive uh, in the sense that is usually argued for or, or in, in, the, in the news. So that's why I say if, if, whenever you look at these kind of categories of taxes, the idea would be nothing's new under the sun in taxes. It's just what kind of a tax are they applying? But there's always tweaks that you could make to it to modify it to whatever you're, whatever you're kind of doing here. So you could take the sales tax and again, kind of modify it so that it doesn't fall more heavily on the, on certain individuals. Now, you can also argue an income tax versus a sales tax, which is better in terms of does it promote saving or spending? In the United States, with, with an income tax, uh, we actually kind of promote spending because when we spend the money, then we might get a deduction for it, right, on the income tax. And as you earn the money, if you get like the deduction, then, then you, you might be paying less taxes. With a sales tax type of system, you get taxed when you buy things. So, so unless you're buying, you know, things that aren't taxable, like possibly the food, the necessities, when you're buying yachts or things like that, you are going to get hit with the tax. So it's, it's actually promotes a saving. A sales tax might be more promoting of a saving uh, kind of system. So that's another thing to, to, that's interesting between the two. So those are the general categories.